Hi, this is Bobby John Bauman from the Ask Bobby John Show. Um, I just want to give a, a quick shout out uh, for a, a event that we're going to be having this Sunday, which is April 8th at 6 o'clock p.m. We're going to have what's called a Youth Retro Night, and we're going to have students that will be performing songs um, from the bygone era, from the, from the classic, uh, classic era of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, some of the 80s some of the 90s but uh, this year we're going to have a lot of folks that are going to be singing um, from the 50s we're going to have uh, somebody who, uh, Michael Monaki is going to sing uh, Fly Me to the Moon from Frank Sinatra uh, Trey Freeman's going to be singing Ain't That a Kick in the Head from Dean Martin um, and we're going to have a number of uh, outstanding artists from the Valley's Got Talent competition. They'll be performing, including three of the winners of the Valley's Got Talent. Uh, Brent Kimball, who won uh, the Valley's Got Talent this year, will be performing his uh, award-winning um, song that he did, as well as the Elisha Fletcher and the Fletcher Boys will be performing. And uh, they tore the house down last year with uh, a Jackson 5 performance that was just uh, outstanding. And they dressed up like the Jackson 5 with uh, red jackets and everything. So they'll be back performing again this year. As well as Jacqueline Shea will be performing as well. Uh, Jackie Velasquez. Velasquez. Velasquez, <laughs> sorry. Um, and Jackie's actually here with me today to be interviewed, which I'm really excited about because uh, um, the the show that uh, uh, we're having, the, the Ask Bobby John show, is uh, uh, geared toward parents to understand um, teen culture. And uh, what better way to find out about teen culture than actually ask a teenager? So <laughs> that's why I'm having Jackie on today. Uh, I've dialogued with her a number of times in the past and uh, found her to be articulate in, in uh, how she's explained teen culture. And I think that uh, it'll be instructive for, for everyone who listens in today. And um, um, also concerning the Retro Night, the tickets, um, if you go to eventbrite.com and then in the information search bar, type in uh, Youth Retro Night, it'll pop up, and they're $20 a ticket. Or you can uh, call or text me at 608-556-3068, and all of the proceeds will go to benefit the new Sycamore Youth and Community Center in Steubenville. And uh, you can also get tables of seven uh, for $140. That's $20 a ticket. Um, and it includes a full meal, um, a catered meal from Manfred's. And uh, um, it's, it's going to be a dynamite event. You will be blown away. It was probably the best thing we did last year. Uh, it was flat out awesome. All the kids dress up like the artists they're going to portray. And then we'll sing their song. So hope to see you there this Sunday. But uh, um, I'm really pleased today to uh, have uh, Jacqueline Shea in to uh, be interviewed uh, concerning teens and teen culture. And um, uh, I met Jackie initially through the Valley's Got Talent competition back in 2015. And she uh, was just a little girl, probably about four foot 11, <laughs> and uh, um, came and she barely made it into the competition. I'll just be honest with you, she was on the final cut. Um, because I was uh, kind of the one making the decision one way or the other whether she'd make it in. And I just thought, oh, this girl's got a little something. And so I went ahead, and uh, she was my final entry mm -hmm. in the competition. And then she sang a song uh, that was orig originally, uh, or I should say made famous by Jackie Avenko, who's from Pittsburgh, by the way, who was on America's Got Talent and uh, I think won that competition or was in second. I'm not sure, but she did very well, um, And uh, which is P.A. Yezu. And she sang that song, and she hit a note, a high note in it and sang it for a long, long time that just pierced your soul. I mean, I was standing on the side of the stage and, you know, tears started coming down. I mean, it was just beautiful, just beautiful. And um, um, the song was great besides that, but that note just sealed the deal, and she ended up winning the competition. So could you share a little bit about The Valley's Got Talent and kind of your thoughts on that and your experience with that? Well, it was my first time um, singing solo in front of an audience. I used to sing a lot um, in like a four-part quartet with my family. Um, my mom would teach me and my three other siblings. I have five siblings, but three of them were in that little singing group with me. Um, my sister Angela usually sang alto or soprano. My mom sang alto. She taught my brothers the tenor and bass, and I was the, the soprano. And we would go around, you know, four parts, just singing little hymns. Um, but it was my first time singing on my own, and I was very scared. During the audition, I 
just was really nervous. My whole voice was shaking. And I was very surprised to find out I had gotten in. Um, and then during the whole competition, I was just awestruck by all of the talent around me. I was, I was just sitting there, <laughs> very intimidated. I was just after the intermission, you know, one or two acts after the um, intermission. And I was backstage and I was thinking and I said, well, <laughs> this is it. So I went up there and I was very, very, very nervous. It started out weak and at a certain point in the song, I just thought to myself, this is your shot, don't screw it up. <laughs> <laughs> just picture it's an empty room and you're just singing to yourself or picture you're back in New Jersey because that's where I'm from, in the woods and you're just enjoying a beautiful day. So I just let it loose and the response from the crowd made me very happy. It also made me blush a lot. <laughs> um, but I was just completely awestruck when they called my name for the grand prize because I, those, the people beside me could tell I, my reaction was just <laughs> <laughs> hand over the mouth, just completely awestruck. I started crying. I was all that sappy. Um, it was very surreal. surreal. It felt like a movie. It felt like a movie ending, and I just, I couldn't believe it. Now, if I recall, you said that um, you were, weren't even sure you are going to hit that note, and just kind of mid-song you thought, well, I'm just going to go ahead and go for the high note. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I, I knew I could hit it, but I wasn't sure if I wanted to. I wasn't sure if I wanted to take the risk, but... I'm glad I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was great. It's still on YouTube. If you want to check it out, go to Valley's Got Talent 2015 and go, I think it's at the 101 mark or right, like at the one hour mark. You can watch a performance if you'd like. But uh, today we're here to discuss a little bit about teen culture. Uh, share your thoughts on the very, very popular show um, that's on um, uh, Netflix called 13 Reasons Why. I get a lot of questions from parents concerning that show. Um, I, I actually watched the show myself just to find out what all the parents are talking about. But I'd love to hear your perspective on it and why it appeals to teens. Well, that's a loaded question because I don't share the same perspective as a lot of teens on that show. But I can see why it appeals to them because there are a lot of um, topics brought up in that show that... Uh, we can find relatable, like a lot of, um, there's slut shaming and that happens with just girls who don't deserve it. It happens in, I think the second episode of the show. Um, a guy starts a rumor about the girl Hannah and says that they did things that they hadn't done. And she's shamed around the school and that begins the whole process of her bullying and I can say for myself that I've had things said about me that aren't true and it's very detrimental and damaging um, but I think teens are drawn to that because they can relate and they know they, they know um, what it's like to be in those situations and also the way that the kids you know speak to one another in that show seems really harsh, but that's exactly how they do it in real life. So it's, <laughs> I, I disagree with a lot of the reasons that she used, but a lot of the reasons that they were using to try and cope with the fact that she committed suicide was, th those were, um, <laughs> they were trying to reason about why it wasn't their fault, which is true in some cases, like she didn't have to do it. But I think, um, sorry, a mind blank. <laughs> okay. So basically you're saying that uh, uh, the way that the show portrayed teen culture within the high school was realistic, especially in the, the way that they dialogue with one another, talk with one another, and uh, some of the um, um, 
shaming that was done is common in high school. Yes. And um, and a lot of the lot of the bullying and just the slight things that people say, you know, like a lot of the things, the little things that happened were so of of such great paramount to her that they don't they don't you don't really think that, you know, saying one word or calling someone a name will stick to them that much, but it does. Mm. So it's a lot of the little things that, you know, like soft core bullying that a lot of um, student counselors and things just kind of overlook. They're like, oh, these kids, um, it, it's, it shouldn't be overlooked. And that's another thing that they covered a lot in the show was that she went to the counselor and tried to talk to them, but that's that's the sad reality that a lot of times when a kid's being bullied and they go to student advisors and things like that, the student advisor wants names or and the kid is too terrified to give them a name. Mm-hmm. They just want help, and a lot of times the student advisor says they can't help without a name. So I think that's another big problem that we need to solve in this day and age because it's, it's, too, um, it's too hurtful to say the name of somebody who hurt you or they're just scared or <laughs> a lot of different reasons. It's just I myself, I was lucky enough to get help when I was, when I was in that situation, but not a lot of people have that support and that assistance and when serious things like that happen like she was raped it they they don't know where to start if they don't have a name and I think that's what um adults need to understand is that victims of rape and little like young girls they need to know that someone's there for them and they don't have to say a name in order to be recognized and in order to um you know be understood that it wasn't their fault they hadn't agreed to that so i think overall the show related to a lot of teens because they know they live in that type of culture and there are kids around dying and no one knows why the student counselors say oh they never came to me or they did come to me but i didn't think it was that serious chances are if the if the kid comes to you it's serious mm-hmm. because a lot of kids will go to their friends their parents first they won't go to their student counselor but if they come to you then it's serious so i believe that any any kind of complaint that any student advisor or counselor or youth leader hears from a child, it's serious. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's an excellent, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, look at, I guess, what is going on with the show. I couldn't have said it better myself. And I, I agree with you that it, it did a good job of portraying teen culture. It's just that the way it ended up where she killed herself or it was kind of that, in a sense, it seemed justified was, um, I think, dangerous um in a mm-hmm. sense and uh, hopefully teens don't, wouldn't take it from that because a lot of teens go through what she did go through but there's just a p- better path th- that she could take um outside of taking her own life and uh so uh, i agree with you on that um uh, we're going to switch gears now to um uh, logan paul <laughs> now if you've never heard of logan paul i hadn't <laughs> heard of him either until a couple months ago uh, and then mm-hmm. i um found out on youtube it was on a facebook feed about how he went into a forest in Japan, which is called the Suicide Forest, and he uh, took a video of uh, a guy who had actually taken his life, and they had had it on video, and then he started talking about it. Uh, It ended up being um, uh, very detrimental to Logan Paul's YouTube vlogging career. He lost a lot of sponsorships and things like that. Um, But uh, first of all, just share your thoughts on Logan Paul, because I know he is very popular. He's like one of the most popular vloggers in the world. First of all, share for parents as well what YouTube vlogging is, because a lot of people don't even know what that is. Well, there are different types of vlogs. There are scripted vlogs, which a YouTuber called David Dobrik, he's kind of on the level of Logan Paul as a following. But um, 
those people, they, they set up, you know, skits or they have this group of 15 to 20 friends that they get together with, do crazy things with, like fill up, fill a pool with a thousand pounds of dry ice and it gets all smoky or something like that. Or pranking their friends by taping a, a, a dummy firecracker to their hand and blindfolding them. You know, it's, it's like that, that kind of thing. Um, and Logan Paul, a lot of, uh, a lot of teens flocked to him because it was, it was fun seeing people do crazy pranks like that. Um, but I think there are, there are two sides to the story of the suicide forest. Um, there's this, there's this need for something called clickbait that they use nowadays. And it's where the thumbnail, which is the picture you see before you click on the video and the title that puts together the clickbait and they get paid for views. They don't get paid for likes. That's the kind of thing. Um, a lot of people think that, oh no, don't like the video because that's, that's how they get paid. No, they get paid because of the views and that's why clickbait is so important. Um, but I can understand why Logan Paul would take that risk almost because he would get so much like that clickbait is so valuable everyone would click on that video mm -hmm. you see and so he gets a lot of money from that video I think I don't know how many views it got in like the 12 something 12 to 24 hours that it was on the internet but it got a, a ton of views and he got probably a lot of money from that video and the response that just it being shared and shared and shared and everyone seeing it just I personally didn't see it I didn't know about it but I can see why a youtuber would take advantage of that opportunity and use it for clickbait and I know that a lot of other youtubers that say, oh my gosh, that's disgusting. How dare he? They might have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's hypocritical for a lot of YouTubers to say he's a pig, he's awful, because they might have done the same thing just to get views. So in the world of YouTube, any exposure is good exposure because it gets your name out there. So in the long run, it was, it was definitely wrong. There's no question about that. But he accomplished the whole goal of getting people to watch his videos. Because if they didn't know about him before, like you said, you know about him right. now. <laughs> yep, I do. And I Even though before, it made him so. infamous, it still made him famous. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that was, his, that was his ultimate goal, to make himself infamous to be known by everyone, but it is understandable that a popular YouTuber with him with such a vast, just, um, just a vast kind of crowd watching him that he would get so much more, he would, get, he would become a household name. Mm -hmm. And so also, uh, like you're saying, I, um, uh, he was, was he the most popular vlogger in the world at that time? I, I, believe, I believe so. Because so. I mean, so in other words, he would show a video every single day. Is that correct? Yeah, I think he was a daily vlogger. And so and kids vlogs, would... Yeah, vlogs, there's the scripted vlogs, and then there's the just daily vlogs that a lot of people say, they turn on their camera and they say, oh, I'm going to Target. Come on a Target run with me. That's pretty much... The, a lot of those vlogs are kind of boring, but his kind of vlog genre, the ones that him, his brother Jake Paul, um, David Dobrik, a lot of other people put together like a group of friends and they have this vlog that's entertaining and fun to watch. So would you say that that's mainly why teens watch vlogs is that um, they're interesting uh, to, yes. to view? And, um, and also, I guess... Uh, uh, would you say teens are more watching YouTube than television today? Um, or do more teens watch TV shows? Or do they like more um, um, live video type of 
uh, I don't I don't know if you call it real life, but I guess in a sense, uh, the vlogging type of thing, or you say it's a mixed bag, or. Um, I would say. I think it would be safe to say more kids watch YouTube, like or spend more time on YouTube than they do on TV shows, because nowadays, at least for me and my circle of friends, when we find a TV show or something, we will go on just a TV show binge but it's usually just one TV show. YouTube is constant. It's constantly changing. It's constantly updating with different things to do, different things to watch. Um, when TV shows are just a whole different, it's like comparing apples and oranges because TV shows, they have a storyline. They, they don't change, really. They, they change plots, but you know, there's a certain way they, they can't change that much. But YouTube, it just has so much thousands of new videos every day to watch. So I believe overall teens definitely watch more YouTube than they do TV shows. And I think the culture of teens sitting down in front of a actual TV and watching live streamings of shows is a lot less. I yeah. think they wait for them to come out on, say, Netflix or Hulu or Amazon yeah, so not as much live, but to watch it when you can, you know, yeah. that type of a thing. Uh, I'm going to switch gears because we only have about seven minutes left, <laughs> and I had a couple questions. Uh, what are um, some of the biggest struggles that uh, teens have today that um, um, adults a lot of times wouldn't know about that you would like to share, um, that you would like to inform them that a lot of times adults don't understand or maybe – uh, about teenagers that are struggles that they have? I think self-image is a big one because a lot of teens, they'll be told because they'll, they'll be told that, oh no, you're gorgeous, but there's a lot of, there's a big problem of empty compliments or backhanded compliments that a lot of kids just, I don't, I don't really understand why they do that, but there's, there's just a lack of genuine compliments nowadays and that's something that I think just affects teens because I can get told like when I feel not my best I'll be wearing sweatpants I'll have my hair in a messy bun and I'll have broken out that day and I'll walk into school and someone's like girl you look good and I'll just be like <laughs> no I don't and I think that's a problem because there's a fine line between knowing you're beautiful and being conceited. Mm -hmm. And I think knowing, being confident and being conceited, a lot of people can get that mixed up. So sometimes if I walk into school and I'm feeling good and someone says, you look good, and I say, oh, thank you. Or someone says, your makeup looks really good. And I'm like, oh yeah, I, I spent extra time on it this morning. Um, and just the whole demeanor of how you present yourself. A lot of people can think that, oh, they're full of themselves. When no, they just they don't they think they think well of themselves. They don't think all about themselves. So that's one problem. Another one is a lot of pressure. Teens feel a lot of pressure to make decisions, make life decisions, and. I think it's very scary for people that don't know what they want to do. They don't know how, they don't have their five-year plan because they still see themselves, they look at themselves and they say, I'm not ready, I'm not ready to be an adult. And their parents and their counselors and just their school is saying, what do you want to do? Declare your major, this kind of thing um, that's just so stressful and a lot of, just pressure. Like I get asked easily once a day, what do you want to do when you grow up? What do you want to be? I say, I know what I want to do, but I don't know what will make me money. Because a lot of people have a passion that they feel they can't pursue because they won't end up prosperous in the long run. I personally would love to perform on Broadway, but it's not a realistic dream to just dive headfirst into because it's stressful. You don't always get what you want. You're not always the best. So 
I believe that a lot of kids know what they want to do, but they feel pressure to pick something else because what they want to do won't do anything for them. So those are some, those are some things that, some problems that teens have to deal with nowadays. Yeah. And of course, you know, fighting, friends, relationships. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> <laughs> I could go for yeah, hours. one hour show. And then, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and relationships are very valuable to teens. I know that. And just from working with them for 25 years. And um, so, I, I, uh, I mean, like I, I used to say, if I could bring Michael Jordan into the youth group, um, although he's not, I mean, he was a popular basketball player in the past. Um, he's an actor now. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, if the person's friend wasn't coming, they probably wouldn't come. I mean, it all has to do with relationships and friendships that people have, and, yeah. uh, which is very, very valuable um, to teens and adults, too. I mean, we both need them. Uh, I have time for one last question. Um, what about the uh, dating relationship culture today? Um, what is good and bad about it? And uh, do you have any advice, I guess, for parents and or for teens on uh, navigating uh, um, relationships today? Because I know they've changed. Um, when I started uh, youth ministry, people used to exclusively date another person. They would be with that person. They would uh, be the boyfriend or girlfriend, and that's it. Now I know that, uh, and I, uh, although you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it seems like people go out more now as friends, um, or I should say in groups, and sometimes they may be with a person in groups. Um, then I know there's a hookup culture as well. Um, but um, any thoughts you have on that? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> but um, I have my own thoughts on the dating culture. Like I said, a lot of my perspectives aren't shared by my peers. But I think that parents need to know that things are happening with their kids. And they shouldn't be... They, they should... They should um, know where the kids where their kids are because I see a lot of people who are 14 15 and they're dating a 19 year old and they'll be on snapchat and they'll post a thing on their story saying good night babe and they're with their boyfriend at his house and they'll spend the night at his house so I think that's one thing that I just look at and I'm kind of I don't know mm -hmm. but um, you're, I think you're right about the, a lot of people go out in groups now. There's still this little culture of these two people get together and they go out on a date alone. But most of the time, a lot of the people who are dating each other are part of this big social group of 10 or 11 people that are just going out and doing everything together. So I think... <laughs> Can you repeat the question, <laughs> even though it took like five minutes? Well, that's okay. Um, well, I, you pretty much got at what I was asking in, in okay. terms of your answer because we only got like a minute left. Um, but I've, I, I think that that's a good and a bad thing. I think the group thing can be good to kind of uh, avoid – um, maybe situations uh, where uh, what they call near occasions to sin or whatever, where, uh, you know, somebody's alone, you're down in the basement uh, with nobody around type of thing would be a much uh, uh, more likelihood for things to happen that maybe shouldn't. Um, so the group thing can be a positive thing with uh, uh, kids getting together. But also sometimes now with the hookup culture, people are less willing to um, um, be in a relationship um, because they don't want to uh, take the emotional risk of giving themselves to another person in in a relationship. Um, although I could be wrong on that. Do you have any? Thoughts? Well, that's also that's also different. Um, I think relationships have become a lot less emotional because of the hookup culture. They'll be in it just for, excuse me, the sex, and not for the connection. So, I think also the groups the groups is a good thing unless the groups all have something in mind and maybe two people, like two, a girl who's dating one guy and then a guy who's dating one girl who aren't into that, but they're pressured into it. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a big problem with peer pressure and just going, going with it um, that I think is not good, especially if there's a big group and some people are smoking pot 
and it's just passed around the room and somebody tries it because they don't want to be the only person who does it. So I think that's something that people should know that nowadays kids are just experimenting with new things and there's not really a way to stop them, but you just need to be understanding. Oh, good, good. Well, uh, it's been wonderful interviewing you. You brought in a lot of new insights. Uh, I'll close out with a scripture. The Bible says uh, bad company corrupts good character. So I think it's good that if you can um, have your kids hang around kids that are encouraging to them and are um, godly and upright in their character, that that's the best uh, antidote that you can have, I guess, to, to steer them in the right direction. But thank you so much, Jackie. Have a uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. No problem.